Thank you for viewing this webinar recording. Today we're going to discuss challenges, opportunities, and solutions related to the home care workforce development in rural America with an emphasis on coalition building. Home care worker, as we're using the term, refers to the workers who provide non-medical social supports to people with disabilities who live in their homes. These workers are often called personal care aides or home health aides. We're going to accomplish four goals. First, I will provide a broad overview of the rural home care crisis. Next, Sue Mazorski, Vice President of Workforce Innovations at PHI, will describe how PHI is addressing the rural workforce shortage by partnering with providers in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Resolving the rural home care crisis will also require collaboration and creativity. To that end, Amy York, Executive Director at the Elder Care Workforce Alliance, will describe best practices in workforce coalition building. And finally, Amanda Bohr will describe how she put that approach into practice with the North Carolina Elder Care Workforce Coalition. I'm going to frame this presentation with the key facts about the rural home care workforce. We'll start by talking about their demographic composition, including the similarities and differences among rural and urban home care workers. Then we'll discuss the unique challenges that rural home care workers face. And finally, I'll describe how those challenges have led to a crisis in rural home care delivery, drawing from our research in Wisconsin and Minnesota. In the following data analyses, I'll follow a methodology developed by the USDA to classify small towns in rural areas. When I talk about rural home care workers, I'm talking about workers who live in a small town or community of fewer than 10,000 people. Let's start with demographics. There are some similarities and stark differences between rural and urban home care workers, and these factors should help shape how we think about addressing the rural home care crisis. The gender composition of the workforce is one of those similarities. No matter where you are in America, home care is gendered work, and the majority of the home care workforce is comprised of women. And we know that nationwide, Home care jobs are open to people who usually face barriers related to language, education, and discrimination. So home care workers are largely women of color and immigrant women. In rural areas, a large segment are people of color, but not to the same extent as in urban and suburban areas. Also, very few rural home care workers are immigrants. Finally, educational attainment is marginally lower among rural home care workers compared to their non-rural counterparts. A larger share have a high school education or less. These unique demographic and social factors in rural areas are important considerations as we figure out how to best support these workers. The differences among rural and urban home care workers are more stark regarding job quality. We know that home care workers across the country face Im immense economic instability but rural home care workers face unique challenges. They typically earn about 50 cents less per hour compared to their urban counterparts. And they're also more likely to work part time. But that's primarily because they're facing non-economic barriers to full-time work. These include factors like health issues, restrictions on earnings due to retirement benefits, and unpaid caregiving responsibilities, like caring for a child or a family member with disabilities. Longer drive times can also contribute to part-time work. People can't take cases that are too far away from their homes. We heard from employers that this is a major challenge in rural home care delivery. Also, car repairs can prevent workers from staying present on the job, especially when they cost too much. So that higher prevalence of part-time work combined with lower wages mean that rural home care workers have much lower annual earnings than their urban counterparts. The implications of poor job quality in rural America make home care workforce development challenging, and that undermines care for older adults and people with disabilities. I'm going to discuss what that crisis looks like using Wisconsin and Minnesota as examples. PHI recently launched two state initiatives in Wisconsin and Minnesota, which started with these two wide-ranging studies on the challenges and opportunities in rural home care delivery. For each report, we did a comprehensive review of existing literature on each state's home care system, and we added our own original analysis. We also visited the states and spoke with diverse stakeholders, including consumers, employers, state policymakers, and others. I'll focus on what we learn 
and Sue will describe what PHI is doing to address the issues that we uncovered. Let's start here with Quick Trip. I'm really not exaggerating when I say that Quick Trip came up in every informant interview that I conducted in Wisconsin. Often, informants would say, why would someone do personal care when they can go down the street and work at Quick Trip? Quick Trip is a convenience store chain with strong roots in Wisconsin. Their starting pay is about $11 an hour, and an establishment like this can offer a somewhat regular schedule, and there are opportunities for advancement. These elements of job quality are really uncommon in home care. In a rural community of a few hundred people, a place like Quick Trip can be a huge draw in the labor pool, which makes it harder to recruit home care workers. Now consider the Amazon Distribution Center in Kenosha, Wisconsin, or the new Foxconn campus that will soon open in Mount Pleasant. These industries are bringing thousands of well-paying jobs to the state, and as the economy has turned around in recent years and more rural jobs open up, recruiting home care workers becomes harder. Tight competition for workers poses a huge challenge for home, rural home care employers. These survey results from two diverse coalitions in Wisconsin demonstrate how the workforce shortage impacts employers and consumers. Most employers can't find workers, and consumers experience gaps in services. In Minnesota, we can quantify the workforce shortage in more certain terms because the state labor department administers a survey to measure job vacancies in all occupations. Here I've combined employment and vacancy data for personal care aides and home health aides. The evidence is clear that as demand for services increased over the past decade, so did job vacancies. So we're already in crisis. Already consumers experience gaps in services, which raise their risk for injuries and hospitalizations. And in severe cases, they might move into institutional settings, even if that's not their preference. If we don't do something now, the problem will only worsen. In rural Wisconsin, for example, older adults will soon outnumber working age women who typically provide paid assistance. Urban areas will face challenges too, but not to the same degree. But these sa the same trends are present all across rural America. Younger working age people are leaving rural communities in search of economic and educational opportunities in more urban areas. But the rural population of older adults is growing quickly. So how will we ensure stable home care for older adults and people with disabilities? Demographic trends and tight labor markets pose challenges, but there are also opportunities to think creatively and boldly to ensure high quality, stable care for home care consumers today and in the future. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sue Mazorski, who will discuss what PHI is doing to address this crisis. Thank you, Stephen. So building off uh, what Stephen shared about Minnesota and Wisconsin, I'm going to talk about our next steps in addressing the rural workforce crisis in those two states. PHI is spearheading a three-year initiative in Minnesota and Wisconsin. In total, we're collaborating with five home care agencies serving rural communities in those two Midwest states. The home care agencies include Canute Nelson, ACRA, and Benedictine Health System in Minnesota. And then in Wisconsin, we'll be working with Community Living Alliance and Lori Knapp Companies. Our goal in this initiative is to implement the recommendations that came out of the landscape studies that PHI conducted in Minnesota and Wisconsin, ultimately improving recruitment and retention, and improving access to home care services in rural communities. Some of the ideas we're working to implement include collaborating with each organization to learn their existing recruitment and retention strategies and to build on what works well and to also address opportunities for improvement. This includes things like enhanced recruitment strategies, implementing high quality training that does a better job preparing workers for the realities that they'll face in caregiving, a range of retention supports and creating advanced roles so the home care workers have an opportunity to grow their knowledge, their skills, their responsibilities, and of course their wages. We'll also be looking at local innovations that may work in a particular community and weaving public policy recommendations and increasing public awareness with an emphasis on rural solutions. 
So now let's go a little bit deeper into a couple of these areas. I'll start with strategies to improve recruitment. We find the more short-staffed an employer is, the more likely they are to resort to panic hiring. This means that they may go ahead and hire a person that they don't honestly believe is well-suited for the role, but not seeing many options, they hire the person anyway. And then, not surprisingly, that person may not end up staying. So we need to step back from panic hiring and focus on bringing in people who have the right character, who have the right heart to be a home care worker. We hire for character and train for skill. We'll be helping each employer to look at their recruitment messaging, ensuring that it's mission-based and attracting individuals that share their mission. Promotional materials that say things like now hiring all positions, all shifts, don't impart that it's mission-driven work and they don't make the employer sound uniquely appealing either. We're also working with each employer on their interview process and incorporating values-based interview questions so that you can get to know a person's character during that interview process. We're also helping our five employers to identify a range of potential new applicants. We have a tendency in our field to keep recycling the same workers. And what I mean by that is this, suppose Sally quit home care worker agency A, and then she goes to work instead at home care agency B. This isn't bringing a new worker into our field and it keeps the overall number of direct care workers available static. It certainly doesn't help us address the overall dramatic shortage that we're facing. So we've got to look to some undertapped demographics, including younger people, older adults, and men. Did you know that 51% of younger people in the labor force are also enrolled in education? This was certainly true for me. I worked for five years as a certified nursing assistant and a home health aide while also going through nursing school. Developing relationships with local high schools, with community colleges and universities is critical to bringing younger workers with initiative into this field. Direct care work is a great entry point into healthcare and, it can, and we can certainly integrate good training and job growth opportunities for them. I've heard an awful lot of supervisors say things like, oh, you know, young people today, they have no work ethic. It's also really important to be aware of any biases or judgments that we may have about young workers because it influences how we treat them. And then without even realizing it, they may not feel valued or respected by people who have those judgments and biases that are unintentionally leaking out. The direct care workforce, as we know, is predominantly female and we absolutely need to bring more men into this line of work. Men actually make up 53% of the labor force and 40% of family caregivers are men. So the men who have served as family members, family caregivers certainly could be a great resource as they may have learned that they have a calling for a career in caregiving. And finally, older workers can be another great resource. Research shows that 79% of workers plan to get a job after they retire. So direct care can be a great part-time encore career. Older workers are experienced, they're mature, they tend to have strong critical thinking skills, and they may be really motivated to have the chance to make a difference in another person's life. It's also important to note that in rural communities, we have a larger number of aging individuals. So there's uh, an opportunity to tap into more older workers in rural communities. And these are just a few of the recruitment strategies that we'll be implementing. And of course, in each community, there'll be other unique opportunities based on local demographics. For example, one of our employers is near an Indian reservation. So recruiting Native Americans may be a potential option for them. 
Now I'm just going to touch base quickly on the hiring process, which is another key area that we're going to be working with our employers to hone. We recommend four steps in the hiring process. First, we suggest that employers hold information sessions to tell potential applicants about home care and what the job is like. These sessions can be held at places like churches, libraries, town halls, the YMCA, and other local community areas where individuals that we're targeting may be present. Having the chance to hear from an experienced home health aide at one of these information sessions is really critical. They're able to explain what the job actually is and includes, and this of course prevents us from hiring a person and having them quit three days later because they didn't understand what the job entails. Next, we ask the people who attend these information sessions to call the agency to schedule an interview if they want to proceed. We do not call them, we do not chase them. This lets us know right up front if a candidate will take responsibility to follow through. During the interview process, we ask values-based interview questions that help us learn if the person is a good fit for home care. So now let's take a look at some of the potential questions that might be helpful to ask. One of my personal favorite questions to ask is, tell me about a relationship you've had with an older adult. It could be a relative or someone that you've had a friendship with. How has that person influenced your interest in becoming a home care worker? I like that question because it helps us learn up front if the person actually likes older adults. You know, when you look at hiring for character and training for skill, we can teach a person how to take care of an older adult, but we can't make them like them. And so these are the kinds of questions that really help us tease these things out up front. Now I'm just going to touch base briefly on uh, creating opportunities for advancement. You heard Stephen say that in Wisconsin, the organization Quick Trip is a major competitor and also offers opportunities for advancement. It's really important that we're able to do this within home care as well. So implementing peer mentoring is a win-win all the way around. It's great for the employees because it provides a great support system for new hires as they transition into the home health aid role. It also offers experienced workers the chance to learn new skills, to take on additional responsibilities, and to earn more money. In helping organizations implement PHI's peer mentor program, we have seen some pretty dramatic improvements in retention in the first 90 days. And those improvements have ranged anywhere from 30% to 92%. Starting a new job can be really intimidating, especially in home care where you're alone in a client's home. A mentor can feel like a lifeline to a new employee as they're trying to figure it all out. Other advanced roles include things like medication technicians, assistant trainer, and senior aides. This particular slide shows a picture of Marisol Rivera, and she's a senior aide at Cooperative Home Care Associates in the Bronx. She provides support to home health aides on a range of issues, including how to use a tablet to communicate with the nurse about changes in client symptoms. Uh, she also supports the home health aide with relational challenge, like when there's a conflict between the worker and the client or their family and coaching them through critical thinking processes. The senior aides in this particular project in New York City successfully reduce, reduced emergency room visits by 8%, which is a significant cost savings. I also wanna mention here that if you go to PHI's website, which is phinational.org, you can see this video and you'll hear Marisol directly talking about what it has meant to her to be a senior aide. This video was released as a part of PHI's 60 Issues campaign and it was issue number nine. Lastly, let's take a look at supervision. 
a home care worker's relationship with their supervisor has a significant influence on whether or not they feel valued and respected. And this, of course, has a direct influence on whether or not the worker chooses to stay. At PHI, we believe strongly in a relationship-centered approach to supervision. We'll be bringing uh, training to supervisors in the five employer agencies on how to use a coaching approach instead of a traditional approach to supervision. A coaching approach balances support and accountability, and it helps workers to grow their critical thinking and problem-solving skills. I think it's helpful to look at a comparison between traditional and coaching supervision to understand this better. Most of us have either been taught or we inherited a traditional approach to supervision that relies on writing you up when you've done something wrong. The supervisor tells the worker what they've done. They explain the rules or the policy regarding that behavior. They inform the worker of the consequences, and then they go to problem solving by telling the worker how to fix that problem. And of course, they require the worker to comply with a suggested solution. The problem here is that this tends to be a pretty one-sided conversation, and the solution recommended by the supervisor may not work for the employee's circumstances. Coaching, on the other hand, still holds a worker accountable, but in a supportive way. We can start with knowing that worker, having a good professional relationship with them, we still clearly present the problem and then we get curious by asking the worker's perspective. All kinds of important information can surface when we get curious as to what's going on for that employee. And then we can collaboratively explore solutions that are genuinely aimed at the root cause of the concern. We ask the employee to commit to their own action steps and we follow up to make sure that that is in fact happening. This approach is far more accessible, successful because employees feel valued, they feel respected, and the problem has a far greater chance of resolution. So these are just a few of the interventions that we'll be bringing to home care agencies in rural Wisconsin and Minnesota. It's a three-year initiative, and as we progress and get towards the end of this project, we'll be evaluating the outcomes and we'll be able to share that as well. Now I want to turn this over to Amy York from the Elder Care Workforce Alliance. Thank you, Sue. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Um, thank you to PHI for developing this panel and for your leadership on the direct care workforce um, development. Um, the Elder Care Workforce Alliance is a coalition of 31 national organizations, including PHI, representing the entire interdisciplinary care team, including consumers, family caregivers, direct care workers, providers, and healthcare professionals. Through this collaboration, EWA develops and implements policy solutions that advance a well-trained and sufficient elder care workforce. The Alliance was formed almost 10 years ago in response to the 2008 Institute of Medicine report, Retooling for an Aging America which called for changes both to how care is delivered and the preparation of the healthcare workforce to provide that care. Specifically, the report urged expansion of team-based approaches to healthcare delivery with care provided by a better prepared healthcare workforce, all working to the top of their skill sets. A subsequent 2012 report, In Whose Hands, examined the mental health and substance use workforce for older adults, noting that nearly one in five older adults in America has one or more mental health or substance use conditions. EWA has had focused much of its work at the federal level. While there are critical policy decisions that do occur at the federal level, many important decisions were being made at the state and local level on the healthcare workforce and, and home and community-based care, 
especially around the direct care workforce. Medicaid rates, training and certification rules, wage rates, community college curriculum, and workforce boards are just a few of the state and local policies and programs that impact the elder care workforce. Because so many decisions are made at the local level, EWA determined that it was important to do some outreach at the state level and began to look for ways to develop our state work. Because our coalition is so successful at the federal level, we saw an opportunity to help local partners develop similar coalitions. With the leadership of Amanda Borer, EWA developed a coalition in North Carolina and a toolkit to establish other coalitions. Amanda is going to discuss more specifics about the North Carolina coalition, but I'd like to talk about the toolkit. The toolkit provides a step-by-step -step guide on setting up a coalition with examples used by North Carolina. As you'll see, the step-by-step -step guide listed below um, is, is pretty basic list of, of things you would want to do to set up a state coalition. This is by no means all-inclusive, and it is also does not necessarily need to be done in this order. Um, it is meant to be used as a, a tool to draw from to, to develop your unique coalition in your state. When uh, looking at background information, um, you're going to one of the things that is very useful to um, look at is, is developing an environmental scan of the workforce needs in your state, a review of the different policies on elder care, workforce, Medicaid, as it, that impacts this population, and an understanding of the key leaders and decision makers around these issues is, is really important. Um, as you start to develop this coalition. Um, within the toolkit is a list of possible stakeholders. This list is not uh, all-inclusive, and we encourage state coalitions to think outside the box when looking at um, interest groups and, sta and stakeholders to reach out to on these issues. For example, many, many elder care groups talk to each other already. So you want to be looking for groups that care about these issues that, that may not be people that you talk to on a regular basis. Um, for example, um, talking to workforce boards and community colleges aren't necessarily where home and community-based care um, uh, looks, looks to, um, to collaborating with. Um, but these are important partners when looking at developing the workforce. Um, number three on this list really is, I think, the most one of the most difficult steps, um, but it's a very important step. Um, and that's really finding a leading organization or funding to set up a separate uh, organization um, to to really make this uh, a true coalition. Um, there are a number of different models that you can look at, and in fact, probably will draw from different, those different models to develop your unique coalition in your state. Some of the factors that may impact um, how you develop your coalition may be, you know, what are, what are those leading uh, organizations in your state? And are they willing to take a leadership role on these issues? Are there um, community-based foundations um, that are working on aging and workforce issues that are willing to help fund an effort like this. Um, so it, getting really that lay of the land initially will be really important in developing this, um, this step. Um, EWA itself depends on membership dues and foundation funding. So, um, you know, that is definitely a way that you can go. Um, but you may have, um, again, a leading organization that could take um, responsibility, but you could also rotate those responsibilities. Um, that has worked too in other coalitions. 
Um, EWA is definitely willing to help you strategize on this, and we have help um, in North Carolina as well as other states to help strategize on how to develop um, this uh, leadership um, component to your coalition. Um, number four, drafting a strategic plan is pretty self-explanatory. I think Amanda's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the North Carolina effort, but uh, one of my suggestions is to think about what is possible and consider both kind of the low-hanging fruit of what are the things that you can accomplish right away, um, as well as some long-term goals that you want to accomplish. Um, planning coalition meetings, again, is pretty self-explanatory, but very important um, to have regular contact, especially when you're starting the coalition, um, to really connect, um, connect those different types of organizations, um, both urban and rural. Um, and in North Carolina, um, they actually rotated um, uh, meetings um, as well, and ha their rural location was one of their best attended meetings. Because um, I think that there's definitely a hunger um, in in rural uh, rural advocacy and rural um, home care um, to to really develop this workforce. So um, I, I think you're going to have some good partners um, in those um, rural locations as well. These meetings really allow for cross collaboration and connecting of people that that may not may have never met each other before, um, and and never worked with each other before. So it's it really is a a, a tremendous opportunity to um, to develop this workforce um, from a lot of different angles. Um, EWA support number six is actually not listed in our toolkit, um, but I just wanted to make it clear that we would we are available um, as as you go through the process if you want to develop a coalition in your state. Um, it, I mentioned North Carolina has established the, um, its coalition. Uh, Maryland and Michigan have also both reached out um, to us uh, for assistance in their efforts as well. Um, each uh, each coalition uh, really is unique to address the needs of of that of your particular state, and um, we really want to help other states set up coalitions. Um, working with a wider group of organizations will allow rural and home and community based organizations to broaden support and expand to expand and train uh, this important workforce. Um, these collaborations are essential to the development of the workforce that will care for us, especially in home and community-based settings. Um, I'm going to stop there, and uh, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity, and I'm going to hand it over to Amanda Borer, who's going to talk more specifically about uh, the North Carolina Workforce Coalition. Thanks, Amy, for sharing the toolkit and the importance of coalition building in states. I'm now going to share a bit about the Elder Care Workforce Coalition that we have built in North Carolina. First, though, a bit about why we started in North Carolina and how I got into this work. I'm the Associate Director at Charles House Association in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where we have an adult day center and two family care homes. I have always had a passion for elder care and for recruiting folks into the field. And in my position, I have gotten to do that on various levels, including recruiting and training the frontline workers. In 2016 and 17, I applied for and was chosen as a Health and Aging Policy Fellow, where I was given the opportunity to look at and work on this passion from a higher level policy perspective. I found myself placed with HRSA, Health Resources and Service Administration, to evaluate the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program, and also with the Elder Care Workforce Alliance to start looking at state coalitions. And we started in North Carolina since that is where I'm based. So towards the end of 2016, I began to meet with folks around the state to discuss what their current and most pressing issues in the elder care workforce were. And to no surprise, 
it was overwhelmingly the recruitment, retention, and training of the direct care workforce. We formed a coalition of over 100 participating individuals or organizations and met about every other month for the first year. This slide shows some of our partnerships and members that have been supportive of this effort thus far. From the home and community-based services side of things, we have the North Carolina Association of Home and Hospice Care, North Carolina PACE Association, North Carolina 4A, which is all of the state AAAs, and many individual home care agencies. There is a more comprehensive list of participants in the toolkit that Amy presented on, which is available on the EWA website if you are interested. There was and is a lot of energy around this subject, and there are many stakeholders around the state that are invested in trying to improve the current situation. However, we needed to find a way to harness this energy and focus it rather than trying to tackle everything at one time. So we decided that our plan would be designed for three years with different focal points each year. Our first year was really focused on coalition organization and sustainability. This is an ongoing process that we are still continuing now that we are in year two. Year two, our focal point is a is provider practices and operations, as well as education and training. And then for year three, we are going to formulate a plan for state policy work and advocacy interventions. So North Carolina, building a coalition in a rural state. First of all, I didn't realize just how big and rural North Carolina really was. We have 100 counties, 80 of which are rural, and if you wanted to drive from the eastern coast to the most western tip of the state, it would take over nine hours. So I decided that I should start by calling people on the phone. And I would speak to those people in both western and eastern parts of the state. And I would often hear things like that they weren't interested in having those folks from Raleigh tell them what to do. And I completely understand that. And I would reiterate multiple times that I was hoping to hear what was working for them or where their struggles were to help facilitate any collaborations or solutions. And as you can see on this slide, I would ask, I wouldn't tell, and I would try to facilitate and not direct. So because of this, I felt that it was really important that I went to them as often as possible. So if someone did want to meet with me, I would try to travel to them. And as Amy mentioned earlier, we tried to move our meetings around the state. And that was very successful. And I'm hoping that uh, as we continue, we'll be able to progress in that way as well. Being an outsider, both someone that is not originally from North Carolina and also someone that is living in one of the more urban areas of the state in the Raleigh-Durham area was initially an obstacle or challenge. But I found that following the energy really, really helped um, get over that obstacle. And then we helped to fill, build and facilitate meetings and discussion and let the hosting agency or group lead the agenda. This effort, of course, takes very dedicated people to make that happen. And fortunately, I was able to spend 20% of my time doing this work during my fellowship period. And we were lucky that there was not a lot of other funding that needed to be involved at this time. More recently, as we have progressed through our efforts, we were able to connect with the North Carolina Rural Health Leadership Alliance and their workforce division. We're hoping to partner with them and that will take us into some of the more rural regions in the state. North Carolina is luckily um, divided into 16 regions. And so as I was ending my fellowship year and starting our second year, I noticed that the coalition's membership energy was really focused on finding work on the ground solutions for providers and less on policy work and meetings. Luckily, this followed our plan for year two to look at provider practices and education and training. I also realized that while so many of the broader issues were the same across the state, the reasons for them may be quite different. For example, in the western part of the state, they were having trouble with recruitment and found that they were competing with the tourism industry for their applicants. Whereas in the Raleigh-Durham area, 
we were often competing with major hospital systems such as Duke, UNC, and Wake Med. This led us to looking at working groups within these 16 different regions to identify their specific issues. So you can see above that the top map here is all of those 16 regions broken out, whereas the bottom is where our coalition is currently working. The template for this regional work was modified from work that was already taking place in the southwestern region of North Carolina. They were trying to fill some open positions in their skilled nursing facilities in order to admit new residents in their buildings. And they did this by working with local community colleges and some of their workforce development. So how are we using regional work groups in our coalition? Um, well, first of all, I mentioned we are dividing into those 16 groups and reaching out and finding where the energy is. And then we're talking about what the goals of these groups are. Number one is to bring major stakeholders together. And those stakeholders include long-term care providers from home care um, agencies all the way to skilled nursing facilities. We are working also with the community colleges where the majority of our direct care workers or CNAs are being trained. And we are lucky here in North Carolina because we have 59 community colleges and a very strong state system. We are also working with the Workforce Development Board. Some of those can be region-wide, uh, such as those located in the Regional Council of Governments. Some of them are in cities and some of them are in counties. And so it's taken some work to identify who exactly that, that um, person and stakeholder is and match them up. We're also working with different regional government officials, and that could be someone like the state long-term care ombudsman um, or a regional ombudsman or AAA director. Other people that we really wanted to include were CNAs, and uh, we have been lucky enough to have PHA, PHI policy director Kezia Scales in our area, and so we've had some guidance from PHI as well. For our direct care workers and CNAs, we wanted to make sure that they had a voice in this discussion and were not forgotten in the process, because after all, this really revolved around them. We also wanted to include um, our state and regional long-term care ombudsmen so they could discuss complaints that they were receiving, especially those related to staffing issues. We were getting everyone together and we are hoping to identify top issues in elder care workforce and their potential causes in the region. And then discuss current resources and ongoing projects that already exist in the areas. For example, this might include providers working directly with community colleges or workforce development boards on the creation of an employment feeder, new apprenticeships, new training models within curriculum that is already existing, transportation, or even child care vouchers for workers that we know are so, so important. This might also include new partnerships between organizations or discussions about what is working where in ways that nobody had really thought about prior to now. Then our hope is to identify where the gaps still exist and brainstorm potential solutions within each region. What can be created with this existing group of stakeholders and who else should be at the table? Then of course, what are our next steps? How do we move forward? What do we need? And when do we meet again? So we're gonna talk a little bit here about the preliminary impact. Um, all of this work is ongoing and much of it is coming up this fall. But the Southwest region started this process last year and they started working with skilled nursing facilities specifically because they were having a hard time admitting new residents to their facilities because they didn't have enough staff. So they have had, I believe, two meetings and are now looking to broaden their work to include different types of providers, including assisted livings and home care. Some of the successes that they have already achieved are um, working with the community college there to reopen the LPN courses working with their workforce development board for finding um, applicants that are looking for jobs that may fit certain criteria that providers are looking for. They have developed new collaborations between facilities, uh, 
providers and organizations, including the Workforce Development Boards and Community Colleges that did not exist. They also found that organizations were now working together to solve issues and share resources rather than focus on being competitors, which as we know sometimes um, can happen. And of course, I mentioned earlier, they are now working with broadening that group of uh, stakeholders to include assisted livings and home care agencies in the region. Amy mentioned earlier that we moved our meetings around and that one of our most successful was in a more rural area. And that is, in the Piedmont Triad region. In the Piedmont Triad region, we had our first meeting last August, and it was very well attended, both in person and on the phone. We had over 60 participants. They were very enthusiastic for this discussion and also for finding operating solutions. They are a very large region. If you go back to our map, you can see that. Um, but they also include very rural and very urban areas. And because of this, our meeting that we're going to be having in October will really be focusing on what resources can be found and that already exist both in those rural and those urban areas because they may not be the same. At our first meeting, there was a large representation of home care agencies, which were very energized and engaged. And in fact, directly after our meeting, I know that a couple of them set up information sessions with their workforce development board to discuss and set up um, apprenticeships that may be shared with other organizations. So we are really very much looking forward to part two, which is going to be held uh, this October, October 16th in the Piedmont Triad region. We are also working in the Orange and Durham County. So the Triangle J region, which includes Chapel Hill, Durham, and Raleigh, and is an, air, is an area that is saturated with various providers. Because of this, we decided to start with Durham and Orange counties, and then move later to Wake County, which is, is Raleigh, and also more rural areas, which is in this region. This is also my region, where I know um, the most about the issues that are going on, and also the most providers. Through our workforce summit, excuse me, though our workforce summit does not take place until October, we have already created a pilot leadership course at Durham Tech, which will then, pending success, be utilized throughout the state. And this course will be created to um, have some career ladders within individual organizations. We have discussed shared apprenticeships among four different organizations for job creation. We have shared many resources that we were not aware were available to providers, and we discussed scope of practice issues for CNAs working in home care and possible ways to mediate those challenges, such as CNA plus four. We have the, begun to identify gaps that exist for future meetings and for advocacy work, such as Medicaid reimbursement issues, especially in home care. As mentioned previously, we are now looking to partner with the North Carolina Rural Health Leadership Alliance to begin additional workshops in the more rural regions of North Carolina. We are very excited to find where this can take us and what policy interventions might be noted to come out of this work. Also coming up in October, we have an additional meeting with the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services to discuss what additional state funded solutions might be available. So thank you so much for your time and allowing to share a little bit about our work in North Carolina. Um, I believe we are now turning back to Stephen. Thank you, Amanda. And also thanks to Sue and Amy for sharing your expertise on coalition building and other solutions in uh, home care workforce development in rural areas. And thanks to everyone for viewing this recording. To note, EWA's Coalition Toolkit is available at eldercareworkforce.org, and the two reports on Minnesota and Wisconsin are available at phinational.org. I've included our contact information on this slide if you have questions or comments about the content that we just presented. And with that, we'll conclude this presentation.